So I want to start by inviting our host for this session, Beate Elan. She is the Open Access Coordinator at the National Library of Sweden. And she'll take the stage to be the host. Uh, and then I'll also ask Sven Salström, my boss, from the Swedish Research Council, the Director General, Jan, Jan Arne Röttingen, from, he's a chief, chief executive for the Research Council of Norway. Jyrki Hakape, Senior Science Advisor, Division of Strategic <laughs> Research at the Academy of Finland. And Annika Sölvara, Director of the Research Council, Färö Island. So please, thank you. Thank you, Sophie, uh, and thank you. I'm very honored to be able to lead you through this discussion on open science in relation to, to the funders in the Nordic countries. Um, I thought that we could start this discussion from a kind of present situation point of view. Where are we now? And where could we possibly uh, not end up, but go further together since um, we are here at the Nordic Open Science Conference, so, so to, to, to continue the, the discussions. But um, <clears throat> I just would like to start to ask you a very practical question. Uh, uh, does your research council have any open science mandate? And if so, what are the requirements? So maybe I'll start with Annika. <laughs> the research, is it on? Yeah. Yeah. The Research Council of the Ferris uh, decided on an open access policy, open data, some years ago. But, I mean, we rely on what you do in the other countries. Our researchers work with other researchers. So we take, in most cases, a very pragmatic position. So, um, but we, we require open access as widely as possible. But we don't have a national policy and we don't have the platforms. So we hope and rely on you when you make international or Nordic or European solutions and platforms. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, any uh, I, oh, of you, <laughs> gentlemen? Uh, for Academy of Finland, and that is a research council too, just to make sure that you don't think that there's a researcher sneaking in into this panel. Uh, <laughs> our mandate, that's a practical one, of course, uh, and what comes to the open science mandates, uh, they concentrate on the research outputs. So similar to many colleagues of ours, uh, we demand that the peer-reviewed articles funded by us or done, done in the projects funded by us are open. Uh, gold, green, both are fine, as there are a set of rules on both uh, occasions. We fund APCs uh, when, when possible in the funding uh, instruments or when the projects feel that they have money for that in their research cost, when they reserve money for that. Uh, we demand that the research data will be stored, made open when it's possible, if there are legal rules, uh, limits. Of course, we understand that it's not possible, but we want that the projects, the researchers that we fund can state why it's not possible, that they know what they are doing. This we actually demand already in the application phase, because we want all applicants to give a data management plan that goes to the review process. We want all applicants to give information how their publication plan includes uh, the open action possibilities and that their publication plans would stress those uh, open access choices. Uh, these are also reviewed in, in, in our review forms. All peer reviewers get to ask, get to review the applications based on also on the responsible research issues. So reviewers are asked to comment, is the DMP done fine? Is it okay? Is the plan, the publication plan done according to the open access principles that we follow? So that's our practical mandates. Thank you. Yes, in, in Norway, we had quite a similar situation as in Finland regarding both the open access of uh, research outputs, so publications, uh, as well as open access to research data. Uh, we, have, we started with open access, have had requirements in our contracts since 2014 uh, related to 
at least as a minimum um, archiving of all research output uh, and make that uh, accessible through archives in addition to encouraging gold open access um, and publishing in open access journals uh, and also having now in uh, what we see as the transition period um, a mechanism to to support open access through AP, covering APCs. Uh, but of course, in the long term, that cost should be a part of the, the investments in the institutions uh, because uh, we are working towards a shift from payment of uh, subscriptions to uh, a system where we make sure that we pay for good quality control uh, and dissemination through quality uh, assured journals. So that's on the open access of publication side. Then on the, the data side, we, that's a more recent policy, uh, and we are uh, requiring now uh, where relevant, where projects, where it's relevant for projects, data management plans, and also that those plans are open and transparent so that peers in the field can actually uh, ask for data management plans and, and also then challenge groups if they're not sort of behaving in accordance with plan. Uh, because I think actually transparency, monitoring, openness is an important part of the overall picture. But then in addition, we are in the process of developing a more concerted overall policy on open, open research, mm -hmm. to put it that way, mm -hmm. where we now have issued three uh, documents or notes that uh, go into that by three different angles. One is um, the open scientific processes, which of course includes publications and data, but also includes how the research community, science community can be more open and collaborative, utilizing digital tools uh, in the overall research process, uh, sharing protocols, software, mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, then the other is open innovation, how to nurture pre-competitive innovation in industry to, to speed innovation, but also to nurture public-private sector collaboration in innovation. Um, and then the third is really citizen science and how we can make the research community and the research prioritization processes and, and also the real involvement of science, uh, citizens in, in the research. And that is now out for sort of getting more ideas on these three issues. Uh, and then we will use the inputs from the research sector to develop a more coherent overall policy. Thank you. Sven? So concerning open access to publications, uh, the, the Swedish government, as that was mentioned yesterday, there is a Swedish plan uh, with a goal set to... It 20 must be called Plan Esten, since no. it's Sweden. <laughs> uh, Sorry. <laughs> it's not a plan. No, it, it, because the goal there is set to uh, 2025. So, so it's a bit different. It's a bit that. different, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, and that was actually based on, on uh, proposals of guidelines that we submitted to the government uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, right now, uh, we have um, a requirement for those that are our grantees that they, they should publish uh, open access. But we have then allowed for an embargo period mm. of, of six months and 12 months for, for, for books. Uh, but, but, I mean, the, the goal is set and, and we are working towards that goal. So, so there will be changes over this uh, the period of time to, until 2025 in the requirements that, that we set uh, to our grantees. Concerning uh, data, th this is something that we have been working on. And uh, starting from next year, and I mentioned that uh, yesterday, we, we, will have, um, we will require data management plans but not in the applications. So, so everybody is not required to submit a full proposal with a data management plan, but uh, those that receive grants from us, they are required to, to, to set up a data management plan. And we are now working together, and that's an initiative from uh, Science Europe and fr from the Netherlands, to, to see if we, if we can make some common uh, plan for this. And that was also mentioned yesterday, I think, by, by uh, Bugelmann. Uh, I think it's good to have a common uh, European initiative on this, this issue. Then also, this is maybe a little bit outside of, of open science, but I think it's important to mention that we have also a mandate to work on, on science communication. And, and I see that it's not actually part maybe of open science, but it, I think it's really important to, to, to spread the awareness of the importance of science to a general public. So this is something that we are, are working on also. Yeah, I, I should probably mention briefly that in addition to the policies of the Research Council, our Ministry of Research and Higher Education has a national 
norms on both open access of publications and, and also on research data. Uh, and whether so do our policies, of course, guide the, the funding and the requirements of those grantees who get funding from the Research Council in Norway um, and limits to that formally. Uh, but of course, we want to, to set the, a sort of common practice. Um, but so that's our policies. But of course, the ministry's norms and guidelines, they really are, are guidance for all public institutions uh, that conduct research in Norway. I'm sure you, Guy and Annika, would like to add something on the national level. Yeah, yes. sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. Moving out from our house, I should mention that after uh, four years project led by the Ministry of Education and Culture <laughs> on open science in Finland, which finished la uh, late last year, uh, the next step to proceed with the open science was basically given to the research community itself. And I mean that in a very large concert, context and including also the funders like us. And uh, on Monday and Tuesday, there's actually an open science uh, forum in Finland, which practically is the birth of the new open science offices or coordination center at the Federation of Learned Societies. And there is our national mandate or co uh, cooperation point for creating open science issues and having exactly the same uh, discussions. Mm -hmm. Annika, would you like to add something? No, on these uh, sort of uh, requirements, we all do that also in the application phase. We do have a data management plan uh, required in, in the application phase, but again, our researchers work together, so, so we do what you require often. So if, if they work with Norwegian or Swedish researchers, it will be sort of like those sort of national um, yeah, requirements. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but we don't have... Um, we don't have the, um, all the formal uh, national level, but we have all on the, uh, on the, um, yeah, on the funding um, level. Mm. We, have, we signed the Berlin Declaration in 2014. Um, yeah, so we are working on it. Okay, mm. thank you. Now we have been talking about mandates and requirements. Let's move over to incentives. Are there any kind of incentives connected to these... Uh, open access or open science mandates that you that you have far too few uh, and rather the opposite I must admit um, currently we probably through our results based financing system actually disincentivize uh, open access publication in Norway uh, and I believe the ministry is looking into that uh, in the context of uh, the progress towards the, the open access goal uh, in in Norway set by the the ministry. Um, then I think it's really important to think about incentives, but in a broad sense. Not, I don't want to, to create a sort of a transaction-oriented um, sort of research community. And, and there, there are now some ideas out there in the, in the sort of more innovative groups of creating tokens where sort of scientists can <coughs> earn tokens based on all their contributions to their field and, and then pay by tokens to get access and... And I, I, I don't think that is the, the way forward, even if it, that could be sort of facilitated through electronic platforms. I think we need to think about incentives and rewards in a quite a broad, holistic view. Uh, and there I really believe we need much stronger emphasis on rewarding and documenting uh, and utilizing those contributions as a part of our peer review systems, as a part of our recruitment systems, uh, and as part of our grant assessment systems. And I'm, then I'm talk, uh, talking about, um, of course, sharing of data mm -hmm. and actually providing a good and clean data set for other researchers. That should be uh, as well documented as the publications today. So it should be an internationally recognized register of actually those contributions and it should be documented in a good way. I think the peer review system is almost breaking... Uh, uh, today, it's, it's actually almost in a crisis. Uh, peer review is not a perfect system, but it's really the best system we have. And I think solid peer review uh, with an ever-expanding research system is uh, now uh, threatened by, by too much sort of uh, uh, pressure on, on the peer reviewers. And I think actually to really document all peer review contributions, and in my view, actually making them open, 
uh, but also documenting them. And, and then we, we already have international mechanisms for actually documenting them in a rigorous way so that both the journal and the reviewer can actually sort of tick off that this review actually happened. Um, I think those sort of systems are really important and therefore not necessarily incentivizing, but making the researchers have an opportunity to document all their contributions to their scientific field, as well as we do now with publications. I think that's the way forward, but not translate that into economic incentives. I don't think the researchers need that. Research is probably the most collaborative business, to put it that way, in, in society, but it's also the most competitive. And I think and, and business community, the real business community, don't understand the competitiveness of research, to be honest. They, they believe that researchers are, uh, are kind and, uh, and sort of always collaborative, and, but it's actually a very competitive field, but at, at, the, at the same time, Col uh, collaborative, and I think then to, to nurture collaboration, but still uh, nurture competition through rewarding what we want to see, uh, but that in a broader sense. Thank you. I think that, that this is more of a general comment that scientists today are much more a part of the society than if you go back 20, 50 years ago. We did actually a test of that. We, we, we did text mining of the proposals that we received in, in certain areas and, and, and looked for, for, uh, for, for uh, relations to, for instance, societal challenges. And we went back in time and, and we could see that actually well ahead of, of the, that these societal challenges were identified. We, we, we saw them in, as research, in research proposals, in research ideas. So I think this is really the best way to promote open science, that it should come uh, from bottom, from, from the scientists. And, and as I said, th this is something that we see. And of course, we should uh, stimulate that, that in, 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 in many different ways. But from my point of view, being a founder of mainly fundamental basic science, where we, we really go for scientific quality, we have to have that as our, our main criteria for, for selecting uh, those that will be, be granted. This, this, otherwise, it would be very complicated. But, but I fully agree that uh, in the CVs, when we ask for CVs, we should really ask for, for those uh, uh, qualifications also. So, so, and that should be uh, a part of the judgment of the scientific career. But I would like to stress that, that scientific excellence, in, in our case, is the most important criteria. Open scientific excellence, maybe. <laughs> Annika. Um, no incentives other than sort of the, the sort of the wish of the researcher to, to get access and to share his own data. I think we talked about a lot yesterday about the sort of the, the good parts of open science. And I, I think we see more and more researchers in the various realizing that we can't live in the world with these walls. We don't have access to all these uh, results from other, the other researchers. We don't have the means to 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 get access through the journals. Mm. We don't have the funds to to have national solutions. So, mm. so more and more they will collaborate with researchers who who share open access mm. or open science. So, and uh, in the peer review, that is something that we ask uh, the reviewers to to look uh, mm. and, and reward. You could say, but. Not sort of on a general level, but, but that's just as important as other publications. Thank you. Yurki. Um, <clears throat> incentives for, for a national funder are not an easy topic in a sense that I feel they are very make it or break it for the applicants. I mean, usually the funding instruments include huge amount of money given to the particular project, and, and to find these smaller incentives is probably a bit difficult in, in our context. Uh, nevertheless, at least in the, in the term, when we link this with the transparency, we have a lot to do here. Exactly the idea of different research outputs, the groups, how to point individuals and, and research groups and their, uh, what they have done, what are the achievements and, and, and how to value those achievements is, will be important for us to and then we've tried to work with our own activities to, to make it more understandable what actually funding bodies, peer reviewers, or the decision makers are, are doing. Uh, practically putting the names of the peer reviewers available after the call to 
to our website. And two years ago, uh, Academy of Finland made a decision that all funding decisions, was it for negative or positive, there should be reasoning for that. Phrase or two, mostly, but nevertheless, uh, the, those decision makers should, on top of the peer review statement, tell why did they make the funding decision that they made. And that, I hope, would give some kind of transparency and reasoning behind that everybody could understand why this decision was done. And w w what's the reasoning behind the funding bodies? Mm -hmm. I think peer review is, is, as both of you have mentioned here, uh, is very, all three have mentioned, is very important in this context. And I think that when we select uh, peers and when we give guidelines, that, that's maybe the most important part, when we go, give guidelines to the, to the peers, we should be very clear on the, the importance of open data, for instance, and, and on, on understanding uh, metrics and, and how that sh metrics should be used. So I think that that's a, a very important part of, of the, the judgment of, of, of applications. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we talk a lot about global justice within the scientific community and also the community as a whole. And, and listening to you and also listening to what you say, Annika, maybe we even should talk about Nordic justice here, because we have a few countries within the Nordic uh, region that actually already now don't have access to scientific uh, results, as, as, as you mentioned. <clears throat> we, we do have access to some journals, but we, we don't have access to all those journals that our researchers would like to have. Mm. They would like to have the same access as their colleagues in, in Oslo mm. and Copenhagen and mm. Stockholm, uh, but they can't. Mm. So, so it's, a, it's a sort of a, a transition that we need mm. and we, we look forward to. Mm. Um, but of course we do have access and, yes. and of course we have, I mean, you, you have a colleague in Copenhagen and then you'll write and say, could I get a copy of your article? It's not, it's not that bad, but, but I mean, it, it will make life easier for researchers and it will be easier to cooperate. The world is getting smaller, mm. but, but I like the idea and, and we have relied heavily on that in, in many years in the Faroes to cooperate on a Nordic level. That is the Nordic added value as I see it in this best form, mm. that we don't have national solutions everywhere. I mean, we, we see that all the time. We work together. You may disagree on the pace or on, on some of the issues, but in general, we, we agree that open science is, we, we are in the middle of it. So, so mm. it's just to agree on how, how we should do it and, and how fast. Mm, right, Anana. Yeah, and, uh, so, and, and that's the promise of open science, of, of course, is to, it, it will be, at least could become more equitable, it could be more efficient, uh, uh, more collaborative. Um, the challenge is that a lot of the investments we need to make, and those investments can be just agreeing on norms and standards, uh, agreeing on how to establish tools and platforms, e-infrastructures and things like that, Give, to really benefit at most of that, it needs to be at a larger level of decision making that we, than we are used to. Uh, we are used to sort of making decisions in a national context on infrastructures to fund. Now we need infrastructures that are um, at least speaking to each other, and potentially because the scale effect is so beautiful that it, we can actually have one infrastructure that can cover the world uh, with increasing ability to, to, to handle data and mine data. The challenge then is we need mechanisms to agree. So in a way we need a, we need a Nordic governance system of this, we need a European governance system of, of infrastructures for open science, and this is very much related to digitalization. But we need also global governance of the research system. And, and that doesn't exist, in a sense, uh, because we, of course we have no jurisdictions that are actually coming together. And I think that's a big challenge of funders, how to make the most impact of our investments in nurturing open science in a way that actually is coordinated, that we can get the most out of resources across funders, instead of trying to invest um, sort of uh, without really, uh, yeah, invest in a way that will more or less duplicate efforts and, and actually spoil resources. Um, I think that is a big challenge. And we don't really have a good mechanism currently for doing this. We have it at the Nordic level, because in, in the Nordic countries we, we are so close and we can come together. We have, we have e-infrastructures, e but this is really needed for the world. Sven? 
I think if, if we look at the different parts of open science, uh, open data is, at least in my mind, the part that, that we have the largest potential to, 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 to create something which is really good for, for science. And that, that's because, first of all, uh, research becomes much more data intensive these days, and also the, the tools for analyzing data are improving so much, so we, we can take care of huge data sets. So, so, so I think there we, we should actually focus on that, and then infrastructure is really important. I think also the awareness and, and the knowledge among scientists, of course, but also university manage, man, man, management should, should know about this, and of course also funders should be aware of, of, the, of this potential and, and make sure that we have all the tools needed. And I think, think there that, that the FAIR principles are really good and, and, and as, as a guideline. Uh, and uh, this is something that we also are working on right now to, to, to provide some criteria to fulfill the FAIR principles uh, that we will then uh, send out to, to the, the scientists and also university management. Mm -hmm. uh, just a short um, suggestion or <laughs> idea. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you have signed the DORA uh, statement or declaration? Norway. Personally. Personally, but... but or, or organizationally, organizationally. Or institutionally. Uh, would that be something to maybe discuss uh, in the Nordic collaboration, to kind of do a, a, a Nordic statement on this? Because uh, my experience from, from working with the consortium, the library consortium, uh, working together on the Nordic level has really strengthened the, the negotiations mm -hmm. with, the, with the publishers. So maybe that could be mm -hmm. just a, one idea to, to collaborate on and also to, to show the strong and, and very grateful collaboration that is actually taking place on the Nordic level. I think it's a very good idea, and that should be then both funders and, and universities, for, yes. for, of course, because we mm. go together, we should have the f same opinion about how to view uh, merits of, of, of okay. scientists. Mm. So that's good. So that's the action needed. Action, yeah. Take home message. <laughs> <laughs> Take away message. <laughs> Helena, is there time for the Mentimeter thing? Yeah. Um. Stop with the first question. It seems like the discussion about open data is focused on medicine and natural sciences. Should the principles and requ requirements be different for humanities and social sciences? Are there differences in the nature of data ownership between these branches of science? Isn't the main difference between data regarding pers uh, personal data? So, so where we have to, we need to, to think about the, the, the integrity and other data. I think that, that's the main division. So, so we cannot use the same principles for, for that kind of data as for, for more uh, not personalized data. So, of course, data in humanities would be printed text or sort of art or there are many, of course, different types of data. And of course, all those have different rights attached to them. So we need to respect the rights of, of, of that original uh, data, uh, and in that sense, of course, there will be differences. Social sciences, at least the quantitative social sciences, will be quite similar to, to many of the natural sciences when it comes to the large data sets. Um, and I think that that's an area where we have a good opportunity in the Nordic region on, on combining our social data, including health data, and, and utilizing uh, the, the real strong advantage the Nordic region has when it comes to linked data sets because we all have personal identifiers and we can link health data with uh, outcome data in, from other registers. Yeah. One more comment, because that was from one of the panels yesterday that it was stressed that each subject area are really, I mean, they have their way of taking care of data and I think one should really respect that. Uh, so there is maybe an overall division between two types of data, but then there are very much differences uh, if you go down and look at, at the various subject areas. Jürke, you were first and then Jan Arne. No, thank you. Uh, just from our point of view, principally the DMPs and the data management issues are the same for uh, each uh, scientific field. Uh, you, you need to know what, the, what data you're working with, where do you keep it, how do you store it, how to take care of it, and if it's possible, how do you open it. After that, 
research fields, they, they have differences, of course. I mean, each, each field has to be taken care of separately. Uh, I think my colleagues earlier pointed out how DMPs are important, especially when they are, in, when they are relevant. And, and we do feel the same when I'm, uh, when I'm telling that we ask all applicants uh, to fill DMPs. Uh, there are many, tens, hundreds, that say non-applicable. We don't collect data in our project, and that's fine. But you need to know at least that too. Mm -hmm. So the principle that let's take care of this issue should be, uh, should be covering all research fields. Yeah, no, I, I fully agree that we need to respect and understand the different culture and different disciplines. Uh, but at the same time, I think actually the open data process and thinking is also challenging in those cultures. Mm -hmm. And I think that is important. Uh, I had a meeting with the Japanese, uh, the, the head of the Japanese health research funding organization, and, and he said that I have made a lot of enemies. Uh, and, and that's because he's now really pushing for all the sort of uh, kings and, and queens in the different research communities that in Japan had, has had a very strong culture on keeping their data and, and, and publishing on the data and not sharing it uh, uh, and, and then not get the, the value to society that they could have got if they had collaborated much more. And I think actually to challenge that culture of individual research groups holding on to their data much longer than needed uh, is really important and, and will be something that we will do, for sure, as a part of this process going forward. It's both about accepting culture, but it's also about challenging the existing cultures. Uh, do you believe open licenses like Creative Commons capture the complexity of research data usage? Difficult question. <laughs> Your thoughts on that? I, uh, in general, I think the Creative Commons license is, is it's a uniform, uh, uh, a general um, uh, agreed uh, sort of uh, mechanism. And I think starting where I, I was earlier, that we need standards and norms, I think it's really important. Uh, whether it cannot be used for all data, and that it, it boils down to what are the original sort of source of that data and what are the rights related to that. I think all data that we create as a part of the research process, uh, there are very few reasons why they couldn't abide to the Creative Commons open licenses. Mm. Mm. Of course, respecting personal integrity and all the personal data, which is a different issue. Yeah. Uh, and a direct uh, question to Sven Stavström. Uh, who will re review DMPs required from those receiving grants from uh, the Swedish Research Council in 2019? You at uh, VR, the Swedish Research Council, peer review or other? No, it, it will be a, a part of, of the contract. So, so, and, and it's also a part of the trust that we give to the scientists that, that if we require it, that will be done. It's the same way we treat ethical uh, permissions. Um, so if it's required, they, sh they should uh, ask for that kind of permission. But, but we, we do not really check that uh, regularly. We, we trust the, the scientists. But will the plans be transparent and open? Do they need to publish them? Because that's a way to review them. Uh, that, uh, that's, I, I cannot answer that question. We, we haven't settled everything concerning this yet, uh, but that, that's a good mm. question, yes. Uh, <clears throat> do you have a policy for data produced by research infrastructures? The user community can be quite diverse. I can, uh, so, uh, in physics at least, uh, and I was uh, part of this discussion at the European Spatial Source concerning their data policy, and. It's quite common in that communities that to, to have an embargo period. And for instance, at, at ILL, which is another neutron source, I think they have three years embargo period. So, so during that time, those that have collected data can use that, and it's not made open. And, and you see different data policies at different um, such infrastructures, uh, different periods of time. And, and I guess they are discussed among the, in, at the scientific community to, to be uh, sort of relevant for, for that particular research uh, that is done there. Hmm. Uh, we're moving uh, too, too slow in making science open, we heard yesterday. Uh, do you as funders feel the need to follow up that your mandates are being met? 
as you know, uh, as you know that to say that something must be done rarely makes so make it makes it so. So do you feel the need to follow up your mandates? So I, I'm, I'm a health researcher, and we have very solid evidence of the, the, the lack of, of real sort of implementation of guidelines on what is clinical practice. And even in the most sort of important fields in cardiac arrest and, 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 and cardiac infarcts, we see that the, the guidelines are not followed. Mm. and means that patients are not getting uh, the, the best treat, uh, care. And, and yeah, Sweden has been really key in this because the, you have had quality registers that actually can monitor where the guidelines are followed. Um, so why should researchers be better than doctors? <laughs> Probably not. So uh, we need a mechanism for, for monitoring compliance and, and actually in, in yeah, trying to foster that. And I think that is the more the peers can put pressure on each other, the better, instead of uh, setting up... A, I don't want to setting up a supervisory body or a mechanism to do that. Uh, I think that uh, just adds on cost, and I don't want to add more control into the system. But actually, we need more compliance, and we, we have really not followed up in a good way our requirements on open access. We see that it has been very lackluster compliance with the, uh, the contractual requirements that we... Uh, already introduced in 2014. Uh, we have uh, sent now formal letters to the universities uh, and uh, as of last year uh, and say that this will now be enforced and followed. And it means that if they do not follow, and th this we can monitor actually very easily at the national level, given that we have the national publication database, right. we will not pay out the full grant mm. in the future. I think this is a question that ca can be passed on to the next panel because it's, it's really necessary, I think, to have a culture at, at the universities uh, that, that uh, sort of stimulates openness. Uh, and, and it's, of course, easy to create that culture at the universities. It's harder for us to be external funders to, to, to work on it towards that. But we should, of course, work together on it. But I think it's very important uh, to have it at, at the universities. So we forward that to Astrid Söderberg reading in her panel, <laughs> okay? Maybe I should mention, uh, this is one place where, as a funder, I feel, at least at the Academy of Finland, we could do a lot better. Mm. It's true that we do follow, at least through the final reports, what did <laughs> funded researchers do, but what do we do with that information, how reliable it is, there are a lot of questions, and it would be very, much nicer if we knew what we are doing. Mm. And at the moment, that's not always the truth. Mm. I agree. We also, I mean, we require, and we, we get all this information in the reports, but, but what do we do? Do we sanction? And uh, yeah, we don't, and we don't like sanctions. Uh, the trust is better, and mm. sort of, I guess this will be a transition period again. Hopefully we'll have the universities or whoever is, who is receiving the funds to have it as part of their own policy, so it's um, we, we lack the instruments today and, and the resources to, to do the control. Can I just add something? Sure. This is also important in controlling the costs mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the funders, I mean, the, the, the funds for uh, publication uh, fees comes mainly, at least in Sweden, from the funders. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and as long as the funders don't control those financial flows, uh, they continue to grow. And that's why we are in a very unpleasant situation right now that we need to change. Yeah, and as I, I mentioned to you before the panel, I, I think one of the challenges actually with our publication system is that we, we don't follow those funding flows in a, in a good enough way. And, and that the individual researchers or research groups are not sensitive to, to the costs of that system. Uh, because they, are, they do not see them. So either they get direct funding, so it's just additional funds, so they will be always be reimbursed, or it's taken care of by the library system. And this is very similar to the, again, using a health system analogy, it's uh, similar to the third-party payment system in healthcare, where the relationship between the patient and the doctor, of course, in that discussion, we will always want the most expensive medicines. We want to use what is best for our patient, but we don't see the system perspective. We don't see the, the cost of the medicines, really, and we more or less let monopolists like the big uh, 
pharmaceutical companies decide the prices. And of course, that has changed tremendously in the Scandinavian or the Nordic countries, I should say, uh, over the last 15 years. Um, we need that change also in the publication system. Today, the researchers are not sensitive to the cost of publications, and that's partly why we have not been able to transition. Mm -hmm. if, if individual researchers, research groups had, had needed to pay, um, I think there would have been much more of a pressure towards open access actually from the individual researchers than we see today. Uh, and, and these costs need to sort of now be seen by the individuals. And I don't want to put sort of micro payment in mechanisms into the system. No. I, I want an open system. Yeah. If I may, this is the place where I hate the idea that uh, I'm representing funders or discussing as a funder here, because in the end, uh, what funding is, funders are related always to the money, and then the rest of the academic community rolls not that much. But what comes to the open science issues, we are all funders, mm. as you mentioned. It might be the individual researcher, research group, universities, associations, whoever. Mm. And in that sense, that. Uh, uh, clearly, the roles are much more multitude than we, through our traditional practices, we understand them to be. And therefore, this issue, how to put this community together, that we wouldn't have four different panels, but we will be able to have everybody at the same time with multitude roles that each of us even have here. Mm. Uh, well, that's a tricky thing to do. Mm. Mm. Shall we make that the concluding remarks? Uh, time is running up. Thank you to all of you. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the discussion, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.